Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Danny from the Merlin Institute uh, for Technology Inspired Regenerative Medicine at Maastricht University. Um, I would like to tell you something about a database that we set up called CBIT, which stands for the Compendium for Biomaterial Transcriptomics. Now, I can imagine that maybe for not everyone here, these last two words really make a lot of sense. So I'm just going to quickly go into the, the background a bit. Um, so biomaterials, I think you're all familiar with it, but you might not really know what it is exactly. Uh, but some examples include dental implants, uh, for example, titanium hips, um, also artificial heart valves. Even contact lenses count as, as biomaterials because they, they make an interaction with the tissue in the human body and, and sometimes even integrate with it. So I'm sure you're all familiar with either having one of these things or knowing someone who does. Um, and you know, this whole field is, is, is in, in quite a bit of uh, an accelerated development right now. Um, the thing is also, the materials we have on the market right now, they, they work quite well, but not always. And often you, what you see is that they don't optimally integrate with the tissues. Um, you can have bacterial infections um, happening because the bacteria can attach to the surfaces. Uh, the integration with bone tissue, for example, might not always be optimal. So there's still really a lot of room for improvement. And what we're trying to, to investigate at the Merlin Institute is to see how we can modify cells to better adapt to the biomaterials that they encounter. And what we want to do is actually go to these biomaterials and start modifying them and, and see if we can change something about the, the chemistry or the structural properties that they have. And a really nice example that I just quickly want to show you is, um, I think a research group in the States who did this, uh, they took um, some skin of a shark, the Galapagos shark, and it has a very specific surface um, structure. You can see the, the, the skin um, layer, the upper layer. Um, and what they did is they, they uh, kind of copied this into a plastic material. And that's the exact same shape as that, that um, skin shark. Um, and the reason they did this is because this, um, this skin of the shark, it's, it's very sterile. So there's no bacteria attaching to it. And what they did, so after copying this into plastic, what they saw is that if you, you know, introduce bacteria on these surfaces, so you have here the sharklet surface, and this is just a smooth standard issue plastic surface. If you allow bacteria to grow there for about two weeks, after two weeks you see that the smooth surface is completely covered, while the shark surface, or the artificial shark surface, um, has almost no bacteria on it uh, at all. So what this kind of shows is that if you modify the surface that you're working with, then you can really uh, influence the behavior of cells, in this case bacteria, uh, that in this case do not attach to it. But of course you can also make other modifications that do have uh, an attachment um, result or a better integration as an effect. So um, the thing that we are still uh, asking ourselves about is what is exactly the biological mechanism behind this? Because often that is totally not clear. And it's kind of a bit of a shot in the dark approach that we're doing now and, and just hoping that we find something that works, but we're not really sure why. And what we're using, uh, the technique that we're using to find answers to this is something called transcriptomics. And there are basically two um, different uh, technologies, microarrays and RNA-seq. And what they both do is they look at the activity of all the genes in the cell in one single experiment. So what you do is you just introduce cells to a surface, you isolate them, you look at the genes, and then you get information for approximately 20,000 genes in those cells, and you can see uh, which ones are going up in activity, which ones are going down. And this helps us to increase our understanding of the biology, so it really gives us insight into which biological mechanisms are being activated or deactivated, and in, in, an, in essence, how these cells respond to these biomaterials. And by doing this, of course, we, um, we can kind of you know, come up with materials that have exactly the biological response that we're looking for. Now, the thing is, these transectomic studies, like I mentioned, they, they do 20,000 genes in one go. Uh, they generate really large data sets. It's usually in the gigabyte or e even the terabyte uh, range. And um, we've been doing these experiments already for about 10 years now, I think. So that really makes us a big data producer. But up until a few years ago, we, we kind of had the data all over the place. They were scattered, they were on computers of people who left the department, and even if we had the data, they were not always uniformly coded. So you might have a nice data set, but you have no clue which sample is which. And that was really a big problem. So at some point, you just see that data are getting lost. Either they're really physically lost, you have no idea where they are, or you have them, but you have no idea what they are. So we really needed a tool to um, you know, do this in a much better way and keep track of what we exactly have. And then you know, 20 years in the future, people can still use these data. And that is why we started to set up this data repository called CBIT, which I mentioned in the beginning already. 
Um, and the, the advantage of this is that we get a standardized way of storage. Uh, it makes it much easier to find and to identify and use these data. Uh, we're putting in all the raw and processed data that we get from these experiments, together with all kinds of metadata that exactly uh, describe which sample is which, what happened to it, um, you know, which chemicals uh, were introduced to it, which um, surface modifications. And it also makes it uh, much easier to share this knowledge. Because we don't just want to keep the data in this repository for us, we really want to share it with the research community. So it's really an open access kind of repository that we're looking at. And in that sense, it also really um, respects these guidelines from FAIR, making the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and also reusable. Um, so how it works, CBIT is really, so we get the data, so we do an experiment, we get a big data set. Then we first make sure that we're preparing a data archive. We're also using IDATAP, as the previous speaker already mentioned also. So it's kind of a spreadsheet um, program that helps you to, to uh, uniformly identify all the data you have. We put in all those, those um, details that are essential to, to replicate the experiment. We put them in the CBIT repository, so it's kind of an upload portal. And once they're in there, people can go through them, browse them, search for specific data sets, uh, put them in a the download box, and then, then just download the whole data set and, and do analysis with it. Using all kinds of techniques that uh, you, know, you, you might be an expert in, use this to eventually come up with new biomaterials that you could make and then also try eventually in the clinic, for example. So that's kind of the, um, the idea behind it. Well, CBIT has been on, online now for about half a year. This gives you a quick overview, so we have the welcome page there, which also has an introduction video that kind of tells you what it's all about. And this is the browse section where you can see all the studies that are in there. You have uh, selection possibilities on the left to, to you know, look for specific data sets, or you, you just use uh, the search box. You can go through the, the experimental description so you find out a bit more what the study was all about. And if you're interested in downloading them, you just hit the plus button, and it goes right into your download box, and you download the data to your computer. So in the end, what we um, just uh, kind of try to, to establish with CBIT is a um, storage facility for our data, uh, but also for data of other people. Because very importantly, we would also really like to include the data that other people are generating in the biomaterial field and put them all right into CBIT. So we have one kind of centralized repository where people can go to find these biomaterial uh, data. And um, in the end, we really also want to become this go-to resource for people if they think, okay, I want to have some data about this kind of biomaterial, CBIT is the place to go. And of course, along the, the way of collecting all these data and accumulating them, we also really need to focus on how to analyze them. And that's a bit of a, an issue maybe still nowadays. Uh, because, I mean, there's lots of possibilities for, of analyzing data, but we're not entirely sure yet which ones really work and what they're going to tell us. So that is really still quite a big challenge, but um, we're making quite a good progress with that. So, and that kind of concludes my, uh, my presentation. So if there are any questions, we'll just go back to this one. We have one. two minutes to go yet again, so questions, please. Yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, for example, we're using um, ontology terms, so all the terms used between studies are completely comparable. Um, of course, it does, there's also a lot of manual curation, so we, we don't really allow people to come and upload data and that's it. They really have to upload it to us and we will go through it and make sure that everything follows the exact guidelines, because otherwise, for sure, it's going to be a complete mess. I, I've seen it... Uh, that, that's something we're kind of asking ourselves now because, I mean, the biomaterial field hasn't used omics that much yet, uh, but it's expanding. So right now, I think it's still manageable for us as just one single department to handle all of these requests. Um, but as it expands, then we, we should also really expand the number of people working on this. So, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said you were bringing in data sets from outside. Mm -hmm. Who pays for that? Um, well, the thing is, I mean, no one has to pay anything to get into CBIT, and these are just studies being done by other departments. And I mean, of course, it's all based on a volunteer department. Uh, um, it's just you know a volunteer effort to give the data to us and put it in. So is People that have to decide. Um, I, I, I mean, I would say uh, say yes because the thing is, I mean, the whole open access thing is also something that um, a lot of journals nowadays are requesting. You need, your data need to be 
findable, they need to be accessible, and you cannot just keep them to yourself. And within the biomaterial field, that is still a little bit lacking. I mean, if you go to, into to toxicology, you often see, because uh, I'm come from a bit of a, a toxicology background, um, a lot of journals within that field are really into you know, sharing the data. In biomaterial field, that's not really being requested as much yet, but it will be for sure. And then people will have to put it somewhere, and I would say CBIT is a very good, a good um, option for that. 